Again, know that if someone else did it, you too can do it, and you can do it well, and it's possible. So know your why. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, network. You know, like we all have mentioned the importance of networking, which I didn't realize in undergrad, but in med school, I would say that your grades are crucial. Like, do well. But I think we all know that getting into professional schools, we know that, like, you better cover. Do- that's that's the minimum you can do. Do well. Right. And um, networking will get you into doors that your grades will not get you in. And you just need to know that. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Anya Fombat, and I spark the heart conversations that challenge questionable cultural and societal norms that threaten the well-being of the African community. And I also share stories about growing up as Africans in Africa and in the diaspora. I strongly believe that normalizing open discussions and sharing experiences, whether good or bad, will not only make you find your voice, but will broaden your sense of purpose and empower others to do the same. So if you have ever tried challenging certain African cultural and societal doctrines, or if you have ever felt like it is about time that we confronted these issues in our African community and do better as a people, or even if you have always been interested in learning about the experiences of other Africans growing up in Africa and the diaspora, then you are in the right place. Welcome to Living African. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Living African. So today we will continue our discussion directed especially at international students and prospective international students who want to relocate to the diaspora, especially in this case in America, and those who want to get into professional schools such as medicine, pharmacy, or nursing, and things like that. So I have here with me Dr. Sheila and Dr. Idris, who are my two of my very, very good friends. And Dr. Sheila is an MD and Dr. Idris is a PharmD, which is just doctor of pharmacy and doctor of medicine, respectively. We actually have a previous episode that really guides international students towards the application process to come to study in the United States and, you know, the expectations and things like that, which is very resourceful. And so now we are moving forward to... You know, now we've made it to America and, you know, we have all these big dreams, of course, Uh, in typical traditional African community. We always want to be a doctor, pharmacist, lawyer, nurse or something like that. You know, we got to make it somehow. And so now that we have basically come into America and we are almost done with our undergrad studies, it's time for us to start thinking about the next step, thinking about that ultimate dream of becoming that doctor or pharmacist or lawyer or whatever we wanted to do. So we basically will be talking more about that and the whole process and our experiences that we had while trying to get into these programs. And you will be surprised that it's not as easy as you think. So I have here with me, Dr. Idris and Dr. Sheila. I just want to welcome both of you here. Welcome guys. How are you doing today? Doing great, Anya. How are you? Doing wonderful. Doing wonderful. I am super excited to to have this conversation again with you guys. And I really want to thank you guys for taking the time out of your extremely busy schedules, I will imagine, you know, to share your knowledge and to help other people that are coming behind us, you know. So I really appreciate that. So I just want to know your stories. So, I, I mean, we already spoke about all of our experiences coming into America. Now, what brought you to where you are today? And through that, I would like for you to actually start by introducing yourselves and then you can talk about your story. So I'll go with you, Dr. Idris. Yeah, thanks, Anya. Uh, good to be here again. And th- thanks, Dr. Uh, and all for joining. This is always very exciting to be a part of this in you both. Like Dr. Mbad said, my name is Idris Yakubu. I'm a solid organ transplant clinical pharmacist that's uh, uh, at a large academic medical center. Went to pharmacy school in Toledo, Ohio. I was an international student from my express pharmacy school. Post-pharmacy school, I did my uh, postgraduate residency training, PGY1 at uh, in the Toledo Medical Center. And then went on and did a PGY2 specialization in solid organ transplant pharmacy at the University of Maryland Medical Center. And then, I've, uh, and then since then, I uh, took my job in my current role as a uh, Transfer clinical pharmacy specialist where I rotate between 
inpatient and outpatient cardiothoracic and abdominal transplant organs in the adult population primarily. How I got to where I am today, I think it's the, it's the glory of God, to be honest, but certainly a lot of people have played a huge role in, in, in helping me get to where I am. You know, it was a lot of perseverance, a lot of hard work, but really ultimately the glory of God. The um, process of, of breaking through the barrier of visas and, and immigration issues was something that, you know, when I reflect upon it, I, I really can't think of a, a particular way of how I got out of it, especially as having conversations with mentors. I remember vividly when I was in pharmacy school, I started to think about this issue and I started to think about how am I going to be able to overcome it. One of the things that I was, one of the strategies that I had was to make myself very available, right? So I like guess essentially like, you know, spread my wings. So in terms of opportunities, when I was in my fourth year of pharmacy school, actually third year transitioning into fourth year, I decided to select my rotations. One of the things that I was going to do was to go pursue a community pharmacy APP experience in Houston. Actually, no, some part of Texas. It wasn't mainly Houston, but it was some outskirt of Texas. My rationale for doing that was to go pursue an APP experience at in a city that was that not a lot of people were interested in going to. Right. And with the, with the idea of, the, of perhaps after my APP experience, I would work so hard and I would wow them. And at the end of it, they'll be like, yeah, this guy is a great talent. We can't let him go. We have to recruit him. Right? right. And I remember having that conversation with my mentor and, and telling him how I wasn't so keen in being a community pharmacist. I wanted to you know, pursue residency training and, 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 and do other things. But I was limited in this aspect of a visa and, and I had to make that consideration in mind in in terms of my next step in my future and one of the advice he gave me was you know be committed to your goals and the visa situation is going to sort itself out right Mm -hmm. now while at that point i felt like it was easy i said that done you know this guy's never really been in my shoes (laughs) right never really understands what i what i what i was dealing with but i I, I took faith in that, right? I, I took faith in being committed to pursuing my goals and seeing how things evolved. I ended up going to Houston to pursue a rotation. It wasn't in with, with a community pharmacy, in community pharmacy. I went to Houston and pursued a rotation in, in lung transplant at Houston Methodist. And that really opened a cascade of opportunities for me and, and uh, in, in what I do right now. And when I was going through the residency application process, and again, thinking about what you realize that a lot of institutions wouldn't even, you know, look at your application as an international uh, graduate. Yeah. One of the things that I did was I would still interview. When you look at the, the way it works for pharmacy, you look at the, uh, the ASHP application. They do, they do ask if you require visa sponsorship. My PGY1, at, at that time, I, I did not require visa sponsorship because my intent was to use my, my OPT for my PGY1. So I was able to interact with program at that time, specifically programs, institutions that have opportunities for transplant training. So I think at, as a PGY1 candidate, I probably interviewed with about 50 programs. Wow. And, and that's, that's a lot. I remember after that, that media I felt sick because I was constantly just trying to interview and knowing that even though some of these programs would tell me no, that was my opportunity for me to network, right? right. I needed to get my name out there, right? Um, and in interacting with these programs, I did not go in with my limitation first. I didn't go in with, oh, I have a visa problem. Would you guys still entertain me? I would interact with them. I would try to impress them. And then at the end, bring up my visa issue. Right. Right. So if you truly, truly like my candidacy, this expectation is, yes, you may be a blanket. Your institution doesn't support visas. But some some programs may be willing to go back and ask their leadership, is that something we can do for this guy? Right. You know, so don't cross yourself off. Don't, you know, completely rule yourself out. Put yourself out there. Be committed to your goals. And, you know, don't put your eggs in one basket. Right. You know, 
really broaden your options, consider various options, have a plan A, B, C, D, E, keep going down. Plan A doesn't work, go on to plan B, plan B doesn't work, plan C, and, and keep, keep going that way. I don't want to take the whole time, but, you know, that's a nutshell. That's kind of what my journey has been. Wow. Thank you so much. My goodness. You literally just summarized the whole goal of this podcast. Like we can literally end the podcast right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just to uh, clarify a few terms and acronyms that you use for the audience, because some of them may not know. So the PGY1 is basically the residency for pharmacy after you are graduate as a pharmacist. And then OPT, I believe we must have expatiated on that in the previous episode that we recorded for international students, but OPT is typically a year of experience or at least a year to work after you graduate as an international student. So the U.S. government or the USCIS, they actually give all international students just a blanket year after they graduate that they can work. Now, by then, if they company does not sponsor them, they would have to leave the country or figure out other ways that they can be legally allowed to work in the country. So that's what OPT is. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Idris. Uh, What about you, Dr. Sheila? I really want to hear your story. (laughs) Hi, everyone. I'm again excited to be here with Dr. Fumbad and Dr. Yakubu. My name is Dr. Sheila Enna, and I'm currently a second year resident at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in the internal medicine program. I'm originally from Yaoundé, Cameroon, and I moved to the U.S. for college. So I am an international student, still on a visa, and I went to med school in the U.S. on an F1 visa. So it is challenging, but definitely possible to get into med school on a visa as an international student. So I'm just going to briefly talk about my experience, but go into more details as we answer questions. So just as Dr. Yakubu said, and he greatly summarized the whole international student experience, A lot of, like, I relied on my mentors, a lot of resilience, and also never taking no as an answer was um, how I managed to, you know, like, make it into med school as an international student and ultimately residency. Like, each time someone told me that it would not be possible, I would ask myself, one, have they been in my shoes, too? Like, someone else has made this happen, so I'm pretty sure if I dig deep, I'm going to find a way to make this happen. Right. We'll get into more details as we answer questions. Wow. Thank you so much for that. And those are actually very powerful words that I feel like a lot of us, and I say us because sometimes we have to remind ourselves, like, you know, we're always going to experience hurdles that, you know, we can, we don't make, it may seem like we cannot go across, but we have to always remind ourselves, like, first of all, we've come this far and People have done it. It's possible. If you're here, it means that you can do it. So thank you very much for those words. Now, one thing that both of you have mentioned, which is extremely important, and I have a whole episode or two on that, is the mentorship. Mentors are extremely important, especially for those who are international students, because we have to work twice as hard as other people, or probably even three times as hard to just get the bare minimum benefit of everything that we do. So it's always important to have mentors. And I mean, from what you said, you obviously had mentors. And so how did your mentors guide you? Well, first of all, how was it, you know, coming to America as an international student, you don't know anybody we don't come from a culture of mentorship back home in Africa. So how did you even identify your mentors and how did they guide you through your undergrad experience towards achieving the right prerequisites for the professional programs that you wanted to get into? Dr. Idris. Yeah. So I, I guess I would say fortunate that my pharmacy program was a six year program but the prerequisites were already established in yeah. a way. Uh, so you go through your first year as a pre-pharmacy curriculum that's already established from the get-go. Once you come on campus, you, in addition to working with the international students' office, but the pharmacy department was also very good. I, I got to give some credit. There's like folks like uh, Jose Trevino at Toledo and, and, oh, and yeah. Deb Sobzak. I'm sure you know these individuals very well. Yeah. <laughs> they really orient you to what it's going to require for you to get into the FAMD program if that's what your interests were. And it's, it's, very, it's very well laid out in terms of the courses that you have to take and, you know, the elective options that you have. So you, you really didn't have a lot of leeway in terms of classes to take. And, mm-hmm. uh, and the only leeway would have some... Uh, some um, some of your electives. Now, right. with regards to electives, I, I, I just want to mention there's a way to to for international students how they can save money 
cost on education is you can take some of those electives at a community college and, and save you know during your summer and, and, and save some money and, and paying uh, tuition at, at a more expensive institution. So I worked very closely with the academic advisors and had frequent meetings with them to ensure that even though it was well laid out, that courses that I was taking at the right time would allow me to still apply at a certain cycle that I was going to apply for. So close communication with your academic advisors, extremely important. Right. The other thing right. is for you to be have a network of people that are also a network of individuals that are going through the journey with you, right, that you can attest to their, how committed they are, how serious they are, and you can attest to the fact that these individuals are also, you know, doing their own cross-checking to ensure that they're also, you know, on the right path across the same journey. Right. So you can okay. use that as a resulting board people to like brainstorm with to ensure that you all are on the same path in the journey that you're pursuing. So mentorship is extremely important from an academic advisor's perspective. I think in this particular case, mentorship is also good from your own peers. As long as you're carefully selecting your peers and these are individuals that you're going through the same journey with, it's always great from a, from, from a moral uh, support perspective and it's great for you to also see somebody else is going through the same journey. And essentially, you can use that as a way to cross-check or verify what you're doing to ensure that you guys are on the same path. Right. Uh, particularly, I don't know if you want to touch more about post-pharmacy school, but just specifically records of pharmacy school, correct? Does yeah, so yeah, we're going to touch about the residency part and post-pharmacy school down the road. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We're going to talk about it. Well, in a nutshell, that. that's, that's what I got to say. It's, it's have frequent meetings with your academic advisors, especially when it comes to when you're registering for the next semester's classes. Mm. That is the time for you to be meeting with your academic advisors to say, I'm about to register for these classes. Is there something that I'm missing? At right. the end of the semester, go meet with your academic advisors and say, this is how I did the semester. What does that place me? I am the type that I like honest feedback, right? I want you to tell me that my GPA is not good enough, that right. I may not be competitive enough, right? You know, right. That's something that's going to be very important to me. And lay out a plan for if you're taking electives, what electives are you going to take? You know, there's certain electives that needed to be taken before your application went in. Mm -hmm. And there are certain electives that need to be taken. Your application will go on without you taking those electives, but they need to be done before you start the from D program. Right. right. So if you're thinking you're going to take, for example, in just principles of microeconomics, right? And you want to take it before your application goes in. That may be an elective that you have to take before you even apply. Right. So that's why it's essential for you to keep a very close, you know, interaction with your academic advisors. But I cannot overemphasize having a community, a community of individuals that are going through the same thing and you guys can vent to each other. You guys can use each other as a way to verify what's, what you guys are doing and ensure that you guys are collectively progressing. Right. That's true. Do you want to add anything to that, Dr. Sheila? I think he summarized it really nicely in terms of mentorship. It's crucial. Just to add one small thing, which just to support what he said, like you can get mentorship from the older people, but also from your peers, you know, yeah. so I did as well. I'm yeah. just learning from my peers because from the Af Cameroonian society, and I'm sure the African society, we don't do a lot of mentorship back home. Yeah. And it took into the U.S. and like having some challenges, you know, during my first two years of, of undergrad for me to realize that mentorship was important. And then getting into med school and hearing my other med students' class, um, like stories of like how they use mentorships, like get to where they were. Yeah. And I was like, hmm, this is what I need to be doing. So, yeah. yeah. And I agree with everything else he said. That's great. That's very true. Now, for pharmacy schools, because I also looked at med schools when I was trying to, because I was still, right up to when I applied to pharmacy school, I was still conflicted between whether I wanted to really do medicine or whether I wanted to do pharmacy. So I looked at the chances of getting into pharmacy school uh, versus med school, and I came to realize that it was actually way more, like, extremely difficult to get into med school as an international student compared to pharmacy schools. Because there were some pharmacy schools that actually, you know, they were more accommodating to international students. Like my, the pharmacy school I went to, and I believe this is the same that you went to, Dr. Idris. And, but for med schools, it was like, I mean, it was barely existing. I mean, 
at that time to me, you know, the hurdles that you had to go through just to apply to med school was extremely very, very, very difficult. So were you, Dr. Sheila, this is uh, directed to you. Were you actually aware of the challenges that awaited you when it was time for you to apply to a professional program? Because I believe after you graduated with your bachelor's degree, you actually did a master's. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. I would imagine ideally you probably would not have wanted to take that year to do it. You probably would have just wanted to go directly into Mm -hmm. med school. So I can only imagine all the challenges that you faced, you know, before Mm -hmm. you finally got into your your med med program. So can Mm -hmm. you like further enlighten us on that on those challenges yeah great question so did i had i anticipated all the challenges i would have faced to get into med school as an international student in the u.s no i did not i just thought that you know yes you do well in school and then you know like what thought in the cameroonian society you go to school you do well you get your ace and then you get into med school Mm -hmm. and then i come to the u.s there are challenges you know like i face like challenges first semester of second year and at that point I was like oh my gosh I would never be a doctor you know for a second I almost changed my major and almost thought that my gosh I should give up on this goal but thank god as I told you all I never take no for an answer I just continued going and then um during my third year of undergrad I was doing really well and then I had this organic chemistry professor who asked me to do research with her so that was my first mentor that I can identify so I did research with her Mm -hmm. and at that point I decided to take a gap year just one gap year before med school I was like okay I'm just gonna work on like a non-profit organization Mm -hmm. and I would take my MCAT at the end of fourth year of undergrad so I wasn't going to take it at the end of third year, as most people did. I was like, I'll take an extra year, take that after undergrad, study for the MCAT, do well, and then get into med school. I took my MCAT at the end of fourth year of undergrad, like senior year, and I didn't didn't ace it. I passed, but then I was like, hey, I'm an international student. Mm -hmm. I passed. This will not get me into med school as an international student. And that was when I had to think of a plan B. Because I always knew that I wanted to be, I wanted to get a master's of public health. I always knew that from the get-go, but my plan had not been to get it before med school. My plan had been to get it during med school or after Mm -hmm. med school, you know, not like Mm -hmm. the other way around. But when I got stumped, when I saw my MCAT score, I was like, man, if I was a U.S. citizen, I would have gotten into med school, but with this score, absolutely not. So let's get, let's start on plan B. So I took the GRE. And made sure I aced it, you know, like I did really well on the GRE. I got into Hopkins for my master's of public health. So I just had to reverse my goals. Um, And then once I got into Hopkins, I studied for the next six months and took my MCAT before starting my master's program. So the second time around, I did really well. Like I took the Kaplan course. I learned how to study for these standardized exams and I did really well. I got a competitive score. So at that point, I was like, okay, I've done my best. So maybe at this point, I can actually like apply to med school and God willing, be successful. So I was done studying for the MCAT and then started my master's. And I applied to school during my first year of my master's of science in public health and then got in. Other things I had not anticipated was the importance of extracurricular activities. Right. Um, again, as I mentioned, you study. That's what we thought back home. Study hard, get into your program. But in undergrad, towards like third and fourth year, I just realized how crucial it was to um, do extracurriculars, get leadership positions, go to conferences. I started going to these SNMA meetings as a third year, like undergrad student, you know, um, because I was like, I just need to start like connecting with people, getting all these emails and like just getting my name out there or talking to medical students to just, like, know what I need to do to get into med school as an international student. But knowing that most medical students you will meet are U.S. citizens, so your story will be different. But just getting that perspective and then going home and doing your personal research to see how you can adapt it to your own circumstance. So in summary, no, I had not anticipated how difficult the academics would be, but also, like, the extracurricular activities the importance of mentorship 
and then how flexible you would have to be. Because if plan A doesn't work, you can reverse yeah. your plans, but you would still reach your goal. Right, right. Wow. Thank you so much for that. That was really insightful. And I hope that a lot of people learned, you know, from both of y'all's experiences. Now, talking about extracurricular activities, that's what I was actually going to address next. But in the in, in the sense of basically the application process, right, from when you get when you start getting ready to apply to when you get that application letter. So I would like to hear from both of you basically about the steps that it took the steps that you took to apply and then how you had to present or sell yourself in the application and even in the interview because like I said as international students we have to work two or three times as hard you know than other people who are we look at them as more privileged you know because they don't have to they don't have as many hurdles as we did and of course that has to do with I mean the the whole experience also has to do with the extracurricular activities so how was your application process Dr. Idris? Yeah, so application process for pharmacy school was, again, very straightforward. But I'm going to try to touch on my perspective on the application for pharmacy school in general uh, as it applies to other institutions uh, based on what I know. So at Toledo, again, it was a six-year program. You go in as a pre-pharmacy student, you apply to the PharmD program, and, well, you apply to various pharmacy uh, programs, the FAMD program or one of the bachelor programs. So I was in the FAMD track, so you complete your prerequisites, and then you apply, and then you go through the interview process, and they tell me how to write an essay. Uh, in terms of how to make yourself a strong candidate, I always emphasize this to anyone that's applying to any of these programs, that you're a student first. So regardless of how strong everything else is, if your grades aren't good enough, you're not making yourself competitive enough. So always make your grades a priority. You know, uh, at that time when I was applying to pharmacy school, the average GPA to be competitive was like a 3.8. And mm-hmm. you had stories of people who had 4.0 and still didn't get in. Right? Yeah. So at a bare minimum, make your grades competitive. You know, and that always would, would may increase your chances of getting a chance, someone looking at your application. Right. Now, grades is not the end all be all. Like you have to be a very comprehensive candidate. And that entails you being able to thrive academically, but also these uh, skill set that you're going to acquire is gonna test the ability to uh, have social interaction skills, some leadership skills, and things like that. These are, these are skill sets that are going to be important in a professional uh, journey. Uh, so being involved, I think Dr. Edo and yourself, Dr. Pombada, emphasizes enough about the importance of being involved in various organizations and not just being involved because you want to be involved, being involved in something that, one, you're passionate about, you're giving back, but also something that's going to give back to you, Right. Mm-hmm. So being involved in something, being in a position, not just as a member, participating in leadership roles, that you're a vice president, a president, a secretary, a treasurer, that you have a true leadership role in that organization. Right. And my experience in healthcare, I don't, it's not enough for you to have just a variety of leadership experiences in non-healthcare organizations. So you're applying to a health profession, Right. So you want to be involved in, for in my case, I was very involved in the African People's Association in my school. I was very involved in the Muslim Student Association in my school. I was very involved in various non-pharmacy organizations, but I was also very involved in the Student National Pharmaceutical Association. At the point, I was very involved in American Pharmacies as a body. You need to also have a good number of pharmacy or medicine-related organizations that you're involved in to show that you're truly committed to healthcare yeah. and yeah. these issues that this organization stands for. So I think what made me a competitive candidate at that time were my grades were competitive, my leadership skills that I acquired through various organizations were, were, were strong. And also I, you need to learn how to sell yourself. You know, people always say, what's the elevator, what was the elevator speech, right? My, I knew my strength is interviewing. I, I, I tend to interview well. So my goal was get an interview. Once you get an interview, you significantly increase your chance of getting a spot because that is your strength. Yeah. Right? So once I got an interview, it was more of 
what's your story? What's going to make you a great asset to the institution? What's going to make you a great asset to the class that you are applying into? And what are you going to do at, with your degree in pharmacy? So for me, my background as an international student, for one, for one time, my experience became an advantage. I right. want to talk about the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm Nigerian, moved to the United States when I was 18 and simulated into this culture. And here I am, right. you know, right. sitting here interviewing. I'm going to talk about my leadership experiences that I've acquired throughout my, my being here and talk about sell the fact that despite me struggling with assimilation, I still had time to dedicate towards all of this other stuff that I've done. Right? right. I remember vividly during my interview, one of the interviewers asked me, how old are you? And at that time, I, I was 20 when I yeah. was applying to the yeah. B program. I told him, I was like, you sound like you're 10 years older than your age. Right. And that's because right. your international experience, like coming to a new country really helps you mature significantly. Yeah. Right? You need to speak about that level of maturity that you've acquired because yeah. that yeah. level of maturity is going to help you as your classmates will benefit from that. Mm-hmm. So the interviewing panel will recognize that or the admission committee will recognize that. But also you need to take it further and talk about what you want to do with your career. Yeah. So yeah. interviewing the various institutions like people that are going to be ambassadors of that institution. That yeah. If this guy graduates, I can see this person doing great things. And we're going to be proud of this person as a graduate of our institution, right? Mm-hmm. So think about what you want to do with your degree in, in pharmacy and, you know, just have your five year goal, your 10 year goal. And these goals may change. You know, yeah. when I was applying to pharmacy school, the goals that I had are different from what I'm doing now, but that's okay. As long as you have at the back of your mind what you want to do and you can truly verbalize what you want to do and be able to convince somebody else to believe in your own professional goals, I think that that always will set you up apart from your other colleagues. At times like this, it's also good for you to have a little bit of confidence, right? Yeah. Um, I think that at that time when I was applying to pharmacy school, they were only accepting 108 students. And I got, I, I used to say to myself, you have to go between one and 108. And my name is not there. There's a problem. Right. <laughs> you know, it's not to have an ego. It is just you, you need a level of confidence to go through this process. Otherwise, it's very, very intimidating. Right. right? Especially when you then add that factor of I have this international student factor added to it, mm-hmm. it can easily break you down. So it's important you have that confidence. And then again, finally, rely on people that are going through the same journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, people, upperclassmen that are just like you, that, that have the same sort of portfolio as you, that have gone through it successfully, rely on them. And also people that in your, your peers that are also going through the same journey, also rely on them and tap into you know uh, their struggles as well. Right. That's very true. I mean, you said so many things that made a lot of sense because, I mean, it, you know, just our story, what a lot of international students or people don't understand that just our personal story coming from Africa and the majority of us came immediately after high school. We were still teenagers and most of us didn't have family here. Most of us came by ourselves. We had to figure life out really fast to mature. So just that is a very, very huge attribute towards our character and our capability. And so, you know, and that, and even our skill set, because that means you're dynamic. Imagine, you know, because what the people interviewing you, if they're like, you know, Americans as a whole, not necessarily even Caucasians, you, they can't imagine themselves being a teenager and going to a totally different world, like in Africa, living by themselves, trying to figure things out and then still have time to be as successful academically while missing their family, probably going through a little bit of mental health, you know, and things like that, mental health issues. So it's like, I mean, just your story is, that's why it's always good to own your story and identify yourself through that story, because it's such a huge attribute to your character and to what you are capable of doing, you know? I mean, we both went to the same pharmacy school, so I totally understand having to admit just 108 people out of like 3,000 people. It was very nerve wracking. I mean, when I got that acceptance letter, it was like, hallelujah. Like, you know, after going through everything and then of course, it's like, we feel like we're the underdogs because we're international students. So they will most likely choose their own people. But the little advantage that we had, not necessarily international students per se, but just everyone who applied to that program is that the school preferred their own students first before other students and a majority of the 
of the students that were in that prerequisite program actually had the ultimate goal to just get into pharmacy school. Now, I would imagine that's not the case in medicine, right? There's no specific program in med school that just, well, there, there is in very, very few universities that just take them. It's like a, it's, it's like a straight assured, you know, guarantee that they will get into med school right from high school. You know, I think there's, there's a few programs. I know a few people that went through that directly, but with med school, I can only imagine the level of competition and I can only imagine the number of schools that you applied to Dr. Sheila. Like I can't even imagine, you know, so what was your own experience from the application process all the way to the acceptance letter? Yeah, for sure. And just to mention, touch on one of the things you just said, yes, you do have those programs where you can get in straight from on, from high school and know that you're getting into med, med school. Mm-hmm. They are available. I didn't go through that path. So for me, as an international student, by the time I decided that I was going to apply, I started planning actually a year in advance because, yes, you do have your academic advisors, but Again, remember that you have your own story and yes, listen to the advice you're given, but also always try to like tailor it to your own specific um, situation. So I did rely on my advisors and also did my own research. So I knew like every single deadline. So one, I had to come up with a list of medical schools that accepted international students. And you you didn't have a website where like you just had the list of all of those schools, which is why I actually came up with my website. Yeah. So I had to like look on like every single website all the med schools went through all of their websites and tried to see if they accepted international students, knew their deadlines for like secondary applications just so I was on time for the application process. And then like the primary, AMCAS, which is like the primary application, I knew when it opened and I prepared my application in such a way that I could submit it like maybe two, three, four days after AMCAS had opened. Because there is an advantage in submitting your application super early. Like Mm -hmm. that, I was told from like the get-go that if you submit your application, as soon as it opens, you have more of an advantage than the person who submits it like the day before it closes. Like it gets more competitive as time goes by. Mm -hmm. So I made sure I submitted my application like within the week that AMCAS opened. That was the primary application. Mm -hmm. But the secondary Mm -hmm. application, because I had gone through the list of all the medical schools that I could apply to, I also knew all of their deadlines. And so whenever they sent me the secondary application, I tried to like send in my essays within like three weeks of getting those secondary applications. So just doing everything in a timely manner Mm -hmm. and also like getting letters of recommendations. I had reached out to like my mentors or those who would have written me the letter of recommendations like months in advance before AMCAS opened up just so I would give them ample time to write the letter of recommendation. Don't reach out to them the month before. Right. Well, I give the way. So I did that and that was very helpful. So that's how I prepared myself to apply to res- to um, medical school. And now like when I got my interviews, which whew, God knows that was like a miracle when I saw those interviews coming in because you'll be surprised you apply and you'll be like oh these schools will not interview me but actually like the higher ranked schools will send you interviews Mm -hmm. over like the schools that are not that well ranked you know and that was very surprising but once I got those interviews as Idris said I knew that I was very personable I could sell my story and I knew I knew my why which is very important you know like when you go for those interviews they want to know your why like why do you want to be a doctor and you better have a convincing story right and as Idris mentioned that you need to have like a five-year plan a 10-year plan so I also just had an idea of what I wanted to do down the road even if of course now things are changing but I had an idea of like what I would love to do and another advantage I had was the fact that I was doing my master's in public health so they just were fascinated by that story they were like oh you're doing a master's let's talk about that Mm -hmm. um so I had all of those advantages yeah right so I would say that's my story and of course extracurricular activities which I did a lot Wait, and I've mentioned that like already. Right. Well, thank you guys so much. I mean, you know, I feel like we've already spoken enough about, you know, when or how to choose courses, of course, through the advice of mentors, how to maintain both your academic profile and also your extracurricular out of class experiential profile, you know, and also I think we've kind of touched on, you know, the best time to start looking for schools. I mean, or at least to start your applications. And that would be 
basically dependent on the school that you choose to apply to. Now we let's we've we've, we've applied and done everything that we're supposed to do, and now we have gotten into the program. Right? That's where <laughs> that's where the the real test begins. Right? You know the stress of everything. You know I, I don't know one person who expected the amount of stress to be what it is when they get into in, in into these programs. Like, I mean, you have to be there to really understand. That's why, I mean, in some, I, I know, I know in some, like in Toledo in the med schools, they always, when during their orientation, like the first week, they always talk to the med students. Like if you are having a partner, it's advisable to have a partner that's also in the program because you both will understand the level of stress and dedication that it requires, right? But for some of us international students, it's not only that mental stress, you know, to cope with the school, but there's a lot of financial expectations because these schools are not cheap, you know? So what were some of the financial expectations that both of you experienced and how will you advise other students to manage these expectations that come with the program? I'll start with you, Dr. Idris. Yeah, so academic struggles, I can't deny that academically I struggled in pharmacy school. My most difficult year in pharmacy school was my first year. I mean, I was close to even failing out, if I'm brutally honest. It was a huge transition for me. Pre-pharmacy was a little bit, you know, manageable because these were courses that I was, you know, very used to, chemistry, you know, math and physics and, and whatnot. And but in pharmacy school, the courses that I struggled with the most were the clinical application of, of concepts. Yeah. You know, and I was like, whoa, like, <clears throat> what is this? Like, I, how do I in- interpret all of this? Mm-hmm. But one thing that I, in, in retrospect, that I did not do well, I could have done better, was I was very, very involved in various things as a pre-pharmacy student. I carried all of those responsibilities to pharmacy school. Oh my goodness. Now I'm struggling with time management, significantly with time management. So I find myself where my colleagues after class are going straight to the library. I'm going to a bunch of meetings. So right. my afternoons were just a bunch of meetings because of the commitments that I had. So one thing I'll do better if I were to do it all over again would when you make that transition into your professional program, allow yourself to transition well, right? Uh, cut out some of the involvement. And once you assimilate into your professional program, then you can then figure out how much you're going to be able to take on. And it was also figure out a new way of studying, you know, like yeah. <laughs> I realized that I couldn't grasp a lot of concepts from just being in the classroom. So yeah. I would report stuff and go back home and listen to it. And literally, like, as I'm listening to stuff, I just got a, a blank piece of paper. I write stuff down as I'm listening to the lecture. You know, that's how things started to click. And also, the way my pharmacy curriculum was, was structured was you take in biochemistry one day, medicinal chemistry the next day, yeah. you know, physiology the pharmacy next day. Pharmacy law the next day. the next day. It's like, I can't keep this all straight. Yeah. So just getting myself figured out. So organization, you got to be organized. You have to work on your time management skills and you have to allow yourself to, again, be rededicated to your professional program before you take on more responsibilities. And I kind of overemphasize of having a circle of people that you can study with. I mean, my, I can't imagine going through pharmacy school without my circle. Right. You know, because these guys were just guys that were just extremely brilliant, right? And, yeah. you know, I thought I was doing well in pharmacy school. I didn't know people were getting 90%, 90, 90% of pharmacy school. I was like, these people exist? I got to be friends with them. Right? <laughs> right. So they really helped me identify ways to grasp very difficult concepts. And it was really amazing. Second year of pharmacy school became a lot easier. I thought, yeah, I was like, wow, like, I, I can't imagine I struggled so much initially. Because I just got better over time. And not because the material got easier. It actually got more difficult. Yeah. But I was able to, you know, um, get through stuff. The other aspect is what you touched on, the financial challenge. Pharmacy school is a lot more expensive than pre-pharmacy, mm-hmm. right? And I don't think when my family sent me to school to go to pharmacy school, one, they didn't realize that it was a six-year program. So right. compared to my, colleague, my, uh, my siblings who went to school for four years or five years, studying non-healthcare related stuff or engineering. We were doing this for six years and it's a six year of a lot of expense. Yeah. Right? Yeah, when I got in pharmacy school, I said to my dad, I was like, I was feeling bad. 
<laughs> like, seriously, you start to have a little bit of guilt. Like, is this even worth it? <laughs> you know I mean? Like, is all these dollars that's been put on this education, is it even worth it? Right? Right. But again, I continue to find ways to try to reduce that burden on, on my family. So one of the ways for me was I remained an RA, regardless of how difficult it was, I remained an RA for my entire pharmacy experience up to my, my last year of pharmacy school. Mm-hmm. At least that eliminated the cost of room and board mm-hmm. and the cost of mm-hmm. feeding expenses. And I still was working at the front desk to make some extra money so I can pay my phone bill, right? right. Uh, so right. monies I was getting from home were just like in you know, unpredictable circumstances, I need some, like, you know, something to build me out is what I was getting money from. And then in, in the pharmacy school, I became also applied to become a teaching assistant, which I was fortunate to get. And that also helped lower the cost of pharmacy. What I'm trying to say is, if you can, again, emphasize, you, you have to, if you don't pass your classes, it makes it even more expensive because you're going to have to take more years to graduate. So, yeah. You have to do, try to figure out, it's not just about you trying to uh, commit yourself to other things so you can save your parents money, but if you can't handle it, it's important that you stay committed to your education so you can graduate on time. Because right. if not, a six-year program ends up being a seven- and eight-year program, right. that's becoming much more expensive. Yeah. So take on as much as you can and always look that opportunities exist that you can tap into to help lower the cost as much as you can. Right. Uh, seek out those opportunities. Don't be afraid to apply to them. What's case scenarios they tell you no, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But you have to knock on that door to see if someone's going to open that door for you. And any way you possibly can to lower that cost, do that. At a bare minimum, don't be wasteful. So don't be the type that you, your, your family is sponsoring you to go to school and spend forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year on tuition and you want to go to Miami for spring break. Right. And of- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you come from a family where you that you got it like that, it's there's nothing wrong with that. Right. right? Because you know, these programs will stress you out where you're gonna need that break. If you got it like that, no problem with that. Do it. But if you come from one where it's, it doesn't come like that, you have to be very reasonable and not put your family under unnecessary financial stress right. because you're, you know, not so great choices. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. That was such great advice. Actually, you've touched on a lot of questions that I had, you know. And what about you, Dr. Sheila? Like, how did you maneuver all of these expectations, academic, financial, and even mental expectations that, you know, were required for you to be successful in med school? Yeah, that's a great question. And I agree with what Dr. Yakubu said. And then I'll just like add something. So just like repeat some of the things that worked for me, like planning for sure. Like you have to plan when you are in these professional schools. You just cannot study the day before your exam. Like you need to start studying the first day of like when you get when you start your class, you need to start studying so that the day before your exam, you're ready. So planning definitely helped. Mentorship. I'm not going to go into details because we've talked about that so many times. But mentorship becomes even more important when you get into the professional system because you will transition at some point from like the classroom which is like the basic science to like the clinical world so yes studying is important but also like professionalism becomes really really important and then surrounding yourself as Idris said with like the right friends you know like getting getting around having around yourself like a group of people who care about school will be so helpful as opposed to party friends you know I mean party friends are great But remember, you went to med school or pharmacy school or nursing school for a purpose to graduate and be the doctor, the nurse, the pharmacist you wanted to be. So having those friends are really important. The other thing, partners, you know, make sure your partner understands, like, your why, you know, why you chose to get into that profession and the importance of that professional school for you and the fact that you're going to be studying for what 10 15 hours a day even it's not uncommon to find yourself studying for those hours you know and sometimes your partner can call and you would not pick up the phone because you're studying and so if you are in a situation where you are with a partner or a friend who doesn't understand that and who would fight you because you want to do well it hurts, but it's okay to cut that person off, you know. And then down the road, you're going to be so happy that you made that decision because one thing is true is that you will reach your goal 
But if you're with someone who doesn't want you to be who you want to be, then are you truly going to be happy down the road? Right. And then the last thing I would say, which I mentioned during the last podcast, and I hold on to it so much, is just being true to yourself. You know, like never, ever, ever forget your why. And your why would take you further than... People's expectations, even, I would say, you know, mm-hmm. like your wife will push you further. For the financial part, thank God, again, as we had all mentioned last time, our families helped us. Like my parents helped us. My parents helped me so much throughout med school, throughout like my schooling entirely. But it hit me more when I started med school. Like I also started feeling guilty because, <laughs> you know, like med school as an international student, and I'm sure it's pharmacy school, it's no longer a situation where they send money on like a semester basis yeah you need an escrow account yeah. you know and so throughout my undergrad and grad school it was like oh my parents will send like money for a semester and you know have time to plan but before i started med school as an international student my school wanted to make sure that i had two years worth of tuition oh my some goodness and, and not only tuition but you know pocket allowance too just because they want wanted to make sure that you would start med school and finish med school Whoa. and that's when it hit me that med like life is expensive to get my life together and i would not let anything come in the way of me spending that much money and not making it worth it you know that's when it really hit me that girl you thought school was expensive before but this is how much you cost and one day i actually sat down and divided how much it would cost if i went to med school in Pius back in yaoundé and how much one year of my tuition in the u.s as a med student would sponsor people back home and i was like oh i need to run to the library and sit down and study <laughs> so yeah in summary you need to plan some surround yourself by hard-working people eliminate those who will not help you reach your goal and just be true to yourself and from the financial aspect yes idris mentioned ways in which you could supplement your income and just stay focused right wow thank you so much oh i must have I, I can only imagine how much stress financial stress that must have been for your parents like two years <laughs> worth of tuition that is crazy i uh, remember at some point in pharmacy school my tuition came in late and I was like this close to being dropped out of class. I went to the uh, the financial office and I said, "Hey, I went to the lady. I was like, you're a parent, right? Can you imagine you as a parent paying forty thousand dollars out of pocket? Right. Like, I, I will give you a commitment that this thing is going to come in next week. Yeah. Can you just try to empathize with me that this is expensive? Like, yeah." Yeah, it, it it can be very very yeah, tragic. Man. And again, like, when I when I when I it's it's all about the gifts of God, and we cannot thank our family enough. Yeah, I know, I know. That it made for us. It's it's. I'm sure it was certainly wasn't easy for them. So yeah, yeah. I'm solo maintenance. I wasn't asking for any careless things anymore. <laughs> right, <laughs> I right. I mean, for me too, it was like when I when I was in school. Like when I first came, imagine the the change in tuition, like coming from high school back home, you know, and then my, I was in, I was in undergrad and going to pharmacy school. My sister was in med school and my brother, he was in undergrad as well in Florida. So just imagine the stress, the, and like a year, how much my parents spent just trying to send us to school, you know? Yeah. So, ooh, man, you got to give it up to these parents. It's, yeah. it's, I, didn't, I didn't go on spring break one, one, one spring break my entire college experience. <laughs> well, I was like, well, what's, what's spring break? What's what spring, spring break? break? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. My boots. <laughs> right, right. I know. That's why it's like we felt compelled to not disappoint. Even if that's yeah. not what we wanted to do, we just had to do it because, I mean, so much money has already been wasted basically you know we didn't want to waste the money you know Mm -hmm. so yeah we got to give it up to our parents man i I wouldn't i don't even know how they did it but somehow they did you know so we got to give it up to them now we have successfully thank god gone through the pharmacy or med school program and let's talk about the residency because that's really where i want to hear those stories (laughs) because now we have like what one more year of opt before you know you leave the country so i really want to hear both of y'all's residency stories i know you had mentioned that before but i really want the audience i want you to share with the audience because you know you think that as you go further and further it gets easier but it actually gets extremely complex and difficult so i'll start with you idris what was your residency story <laughs> oh man um i mean this this was this was when a lot of the mental health and emotional things started to like weigh me down where you feel like 
a lot of things are out of your control, right? Yeah. When I talk about mentorship, I think it's also important to find someone, whether you want to call this person a mentor or a sponsor, someone who also understands the process of recruiting someone who has who is an international student. So particularly in my case, I had a mentor who was in a senior position and they understood what it entailed to to recruit or hire someone who is an international student. He understood the process of, you know, uh, for an organization to 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 prove that this position was something that needs to be filled and perhaps you know, there's a lack of interest from American citizens or a lack of uh, qualification from American citizens to put this in position. So a justification like that from an immigration perspective. Having someone like that is always a good asset, someone that's good to have in your corner because um, when they give you advice, they give you that advice from a perspective of I kind of I've never been in your shoes, but I kind of understand how tedious this process is. Yeah. Also, they can be real with you to say I've done try to hire five international students, and only two have gone through. The remaining, you know, the remainder did not go through. Right. That helps you put things into perspective as well. Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned earlier, when I was going to PGY one, my goal was to use my OPT for my PGY one. Luckily, I was able to get a PGY one done. And I was, again, even for PGY2s, that's where I faced a major challenge uh, of how do I pursue PGY2 residency um, given the limitations that I had. Long story short, I was fortunate to get into a program that was willing to sponsor my H1 visa. Wow. And I know this is very rare, and I was just very fortunate to, 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 to match with a program that was willing to sponsor my H1 visa. So fortunately, I did my PGY2 on an H1 visa. And, and then when I got my current position, it, it was sort of a transfer of H1 visa to, uh, to the current institution. And my current institution uh, sponsored my green card. So it was a lot of emotional stress. Again, I, I think Dr. Anna said this, that she started to go into SNMA meetings at Third Year Medical School. I started to go into transplant meetings in my first year of residency, right? Mm-hmm. Again, knowing I wanted to be a transplant pharmacist, I started to go to, go to the American Transplant Congress meeting in my first year of residency. So when I was interviewing with these programs, at the end, towards the end of my first year of residency, these people, these, these recruiters I was interviewing with were pharmacists that had already seen me hmm. at these different transplant meetings. So essentially to them, they felt like I'd been part of the community. Right. They could tell, they could attest to how committed I was to being a transplant pharmacist. Again, you have to, you have to try your best to utilize your story. Going to my journey, my, my story was I went from Toledo to Houston to do a rotation in, in, in lung transplant. I've been in my PGY1 experience, I've done everything that I could possibly do in transplant. I've created different things that never existed just so I can get additional transplant experiences mm-hmm. to make me more competitive going to PGY2. And then spread your wings. So when I was interview, when I was applying to transplant programs, I, I applied to, I think at that time, there were probably only like 25 transplant pharmacy residency programs. Mm-hmm. I applied to 20 of them. Right, and the five that I did not apply to were either programs that I knew absolutely I I didn't see myself going, or they specifically stated in their website they did not accept international students. Right, so there's no point for me to waste my money applying to them or even talking to them when they specifically stated on their website they did not accept international graduates. So, but folks that did not specifically state it to me, I felt like even if they had the policy, it wasn't well written somewhere. That means you can convince somebody. Right. So I went into that interview with a very positive mindset. A few months ago, my my residency program, uh, my transplant pharmacy residency program, just underwent a, a residency accreditation visit. And one of the people who interviewed when I was when I was applying to residencies remembered me because of because of my socks. Uh, like, hey, <laughs> I remember you. You were the guy who wore those fancy socks. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, it's it's just really you know making a statement and making yourself more memorable. 
And again, you may find people who are willing to go behind the scenes and advocate for you and push for your candidacy because they genuinely believe in your in your abilities and they believe in your story and, and they feel strongly that you're someone that's going to excel and they'll be proud to, to train you or be proud to work with you throughout your journey. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that that's such a story. I mean, it's like one hurdle after the other. And I really hope that all the listeners, especially those who are aspiring to be international students, like this is the reality of life here. It's not all peaches and cream or roses. You know, you have to be intentional. You have to really work very hard and you just have to be persistent, most importantly, because you're going to get so many no's then you're going to get yeses. But you just have to stick to your dream. And as Sheila said, you know, you have to stick to your why. Never lose touch of your why. Because if you do, then, I mean, you're definitely going to go to the wrong path. Now, talking about the residency, Dr. Sheila, I know, you know, you know, after, as an international student, when you're done with your program, they give us just one year, but there's no one year residency, right? In med school. <laughs> so I feel like you guys actually have a greater challenge than we do. So how did you actually maneuver that experience, the residency experience as an international student? That's a great question. So um, during med school, like dur- because I'd gone through undergrad and grad school, I had, as we had previously mentioned, I came to understand the importance of mentorship, you know, and just like connections, networking. I already knew, like, you know, as Africans, we know we need to study. We need to get those excellent grades. So that was, I knew that that had to be done. So the next step was to network and try to plan my post-medical school career. So I actually was intentional from like my third year of med school, like networking with people from my program because I went to the University of Pittsburgh for med school and I knew that I wanted to go into internal medicine. So what I did was that, yes, I knew that Hopkins was my number one. That's where I wanted to go to for residency. But as we've all mentioned, like, you need to have your plan A, plan B, plan C, plan Z, you know? So I was like, if I don't end up where I want to be, like, I would still want to match somewhere. And my backup plan would be my med school so I started networking at my med school like really early told them about my visa situation told them I was an international student told them about my challenges just so they knew that ultimately when it comes to rank people I wanted to be ranked in a place where I could match at that institution and still get sponsored for my visa Mm -hmm. so I tried to cover Mm -hmm. my bases there from the get-go and then when I started applying for residency programs again you need to make make sure that those residency programs accept international students and you offer two types of visas as a medical student you have the J-1 visa and the H-1B visa I don't know if you guys get the J-1 visa pharmacy students I'm not sure the Mm. J-1 visa F-1 F1, yeah. Mm-hmm. So once you get into residency, the J1 visa is more limiting. Like it's kind of like the F1 visa for employees, you know. So you get the J1 visa and you go through residency for three years of six or six years, however long your residency program is. But then like you need to either go back to your country at the end of your training or go serve in a remote area for two years for a waiver. And Mm. it's harder to transition to like the U.S. citizenship if you have a J-1 visa. And the H-1B visa is the other visa. That's like the one Idris had. And that's the one I wanted because I knew that with the H-1B visa, you can easily transition into like getting a green card and like a U.S. citizenship. And fewer residency programs offer the H-1B visas. They mostly offer the J-1 visa because kind of like an F-1 visa and mostly the U.S. government pays for it as opposed to the hospital paying for the H-1B visa. Right. So I applied to programs that would give me both the J-1 and the H-1B visa, knowing that the H-1B visa was my preference. My med school offered an H-1B visa at the University of Pittsburgh, so I ranked them at a decent position because I knew that worst comes to worst, I want to match there. Mm -hmm. And Hopkins, when I interviewed here, I remember, yes, going through the whole interview, and at the end, I was like, all right, so here is the visa question. I'm like, so I am an international student. Are you guys going to be willing to give me an H-1B visa? And I remember the program director asking me, so what type of visa do you want? And you're at least for me, I'm always scared each time I bring up that visa question because I'm like, man, would that like make them just not want me anymore? Right. But I need to bring it to my reality. And then he was like, okay, you want an H-1B visa? If you match here, we will be able to give you an H-1B visa. And he told me that was because I had gone to med school in the U.S. Because if I hadn't gone to med school in the U.S., I was going to get a J-1B visa. Mm-hmm. So um, 
I knew that I could get an H-1B visa at Hopkins and also at my home institution. And then for us med students, when we have to match into residency, I don't know about pharmacy school, but we rank our programs based on all of the interviews you got. So I had already got, done the interviews, talked about my visa with all of the program directors I talked to. When it came time to rank my programs, my priorities were the programs that would give me an H-1B visa. So I ranked them like... My first five programs were programs that would give me an H-1B visa, and then, like, mm-hmm. the other programs were programs that would give me a J-1. So um, that was my story from the visa standpoint. And then when I matched at Hopkins, my first year I was on an OPT, but I already knew that during my second year I would get an H-1B. I knew that, like, from the day I matched. The hardest part was... Starting residency during the pandemic, my OPT took forever to come. I actually thought I was going to start residency late. So you match into residency, you think that's the hardest part. And of course, COVID happens and no one knows what's happening. And USCIS had closed, so there was a huge delay. Thank God my OPT came two days before orientation had started. Actually, the program director had already reached out to me like the... Um, program coordinators, we were already trying to find a way to delay my start into residency. Talk about the stress. You were like, my gosh, I'm done with like applying into residency. I have matched. And now my my immigration, my visa is like an issue, but thankfully it all worked out. So in summary, if you are a medical student applying into residency, you have two options. You have the J-1 visa and the H-1B. The J-1 visa, more programs offer it, but then you have to pay back at the end of your residency. You need to like serve in a remote area for two years or go back to your home country for two years. And then it's harder to become, to get a green card on a J-1, on a J-1 visa. And the H-1, fewer programs offer it, but it's easier to get a green card afterward. Wow. Thank you so much for that. That was very, very resourceful. Again, I just want to thank both of you so much, you know, for this, this conversation. Like, I'm super excited for everyone to, to hear about it because... I mean, this is something I wish I I heard or someone told me, you know, before I was coming over to America. And I, I would imagine it's not that much different in like other countries like your, uh, the UK, for example. Uh, they probably have some differences based on their regulations out there. But I feel like international students as a whole still have that hurdle that they always face at each step of the way. So I really want to thank you guys so much. So in closing, if a, a prospective student had to ask you about you know, the three things that they should expect as an international student in America, what will you say, Number, uh, for, for example, Idris? I would say uh, be very open-minded. Uh, allow yourself to, to, to learn from different individuals and, and also learn different cultures. Be committed to hard work. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work for you to accomplish your goals. And be learn try to persevere, learn to just continue to push, keep on going, keep it, keep on going, regardless of the different challenges of life may uh, throw at you. A couple of things that I want to touch on that Dr. Enel mentioned were, one, communicating with your institution about your, your situation. Uh, they yeah. probably already knew, but when I was graduating from my school of pharmacy, we actually had a committee, a couple of international students, you know, had a committee that, we're, meeting, we're sitting on this student body where to come up with solutions specifically for international students. And our, our major point was that international students are coming to pharmacy school. They're paying a lot of money to, to, through pharmacy school. However, we felt like the institute pharmacist programs weren't providing enough support for international students. Yeah. So every, for everyone who goes through pharmacy school would like to get a job and practice pharmacy. So if the schools are willing to accept international students and, you know, train them through pharmacy school, they ought to be able to provide some sort of assistance or at least through their network and, you know, give students, you know, resources to, on people who are maybe willing to sponsor visas. So work very closely with your, uh, with your various institutions. The other thing for residencies is some institutions have residencies for international graduates for pharmacy. So look into some, some of those programs that may have residencies for international st- that are specifically catered to uh, international students or international graduates. Some institutions have specific uh, relationships with uh, universities abroad, but international students that went to school in the U.S. can also apply to such programs. I remember when I was, when I was going through my 
rotation at Houston Methodist, they have an international residency. One of the things that my mentor at that time asked was, you know, worst case scenario, I could, I could apply to this international residency and that 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 would be uh, an opportunity for me to, uh, to to post a residency. I also did my PGY-1 at my, where I went to pharmacy school, because again, they were able to work with me with my, with my immigration situation and them willing, being willing to work with me also allowed me to, to have the ability to pursue a PGY-2 residency training. Right. And I think Dr. Eno also mentioned this, and I think I mentioned this earlier, don't go into your interview with your visa issues first. Uh, oftentimes, <laughs> right. that would shut down the interview right there and then. Go in, wow your interviewer, get that position. Sometimes you get it, get that feeling from, from the interview that, yes, I feel like I killed it. You know, like, I really killed it. There's no way that they're going to give me this position. Kill it. And then at the end, when they ask you, what are the things would you like to mention? What are the things, what are the questions do you have? And then you bring out the visa issue. Right. For the interviewer, right. it's going to be a very sentimental moment for them. Like, wow, like I can really see myself working with Dr. Fum. I really want to have my program. It's not fair that I don't get to have her because of this visa issue. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would go back to my institution. I would talk to people at my institution and see if there's any way we can walk around this whole visa issue. Right. That's very true. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Dr. Sheila... Before you give the, your three things, I just wanted you to briefly talk about, because I know you had mentioned program that you have, and I believe in the last episode we spoke about that, but I just want you to give a brief preview about the program and the website that you have and the services that you offer for those who want to contact you. Yeah, for sure. So I started this website. It's www.sheilanlmd.com to help any international pre-medical student trying to get into med school in the U.S. And throughout this podcast and the previous podcast, like we all have talked about the challenges that international students have faced. And some of these things I didn't know starting as an undergrad here in med school. So I learned from my experiences, from my mistakes, and I would love to help like any international student who wants to go through this same journey, avoid some of the mistakes I did, and just like make the experience a lot easier for them. For example, I didn't know about the list of like medical schools where international students could apply to. There was no website where it was all written down on. I just had to go through every single school and do my research and just talk about like what you need to do to be a strong candidate, help with like your personal statement and also um, how to fill in your AMCAS application. And you can email me at info at Sheila and Thank you very much. And it's on the first first serve basis. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, going to the overall three things that you will tell a prospective international student who wants to come study here in America. Yeah, for sure. Dr. Idris had like great advice and to add up on add up add on to that I would say be very inten intentional and you all have heard me mention you know your why and that would just keep you that would just keep you going because life gets hard you know like your people will tell you no so many times and people will tell you that you cannot do it like the number of times you hear it it's like mind-blowing but just know your why and again know that if someone else did it you too can do it and you can do it well and it's possible so know your why that's the first thing and then the second thing, network, you know, like we all have mentioned the importance of networking, which I didn't realize in undergrad, but in med school, I would say that your grades are crucial, like do well. But I think we all know that getting into professional schools, we know that like you better cover, th that's that's the minimum you can do, do well. Right. And um, networking will get you into doors that your grades will not get you in. And you just need to know that, you know. Um, so network with people and be genuine, you know, as I was always told, find a mentor and a sponsor, but don't just go to that sponsor when, or mentor when you need something, you know, like reach out to them here and there just so that even if it's three years down the road and you send them an email, they'll be happy to read your email because they just won't feel like you're using them. Mm -hmm. So network, but maintain that relationship. And then the last thing that we all have mentioned, like work hard because <laughs> you're going right. to work really hard. Harder than you ever imagined, but it's so worth it because there are results when you work hard. Yeah. So, yeah, those three comments. That's very it true. It is possible, guys. Do not give up. <laughs> I know, it is. Uh, that's very true. And for you, Dr. Idris, how can the listeners reach you if they need any kind of advice? Yeah, they can uh, send me an email, Idris Yakubu. So it's I D R I S Yakubu, Y A K U B U 90 at gmail.com. 
And uh, certainly always open to, to mentoring folks, talking about my journey, and we can set up a time to talk and figure out what your specific circumstances are and say I can help. Right. Well, thank you both so much for this very, very resourceful conversation. And I hope that the conversation does not only end here. I hope that, you know, we can all in our various communities take this conversation and have them amongst our peers and help each other to go forward, especially for those who are trying to, you know, transition from Africa to the West as a whole. I'm really glad that we got to talk about this and I hope that it also helps everyone out there who has dreams and aspirations to be where we are today and it's very important to know that it didn't take a day's work it did not take just you know partying and having fun in the US of A it took a lot of hard work a lot of persistence and a lot of discipline so I just want to thank both of you once more for being here and I will see you in the next episode thank you bye That's it for today. Thank you for listening to our show. If you want to participate in the show or find out more helpful resources, then visit www.livingafricanpodcast.com for more information or email us at hello at livingafricanpodcast.com. Also, don't forget to connect with us on all social media platforms at Living African Podcast. You can also connect with Anyo directly on Facebook or Instagram at Anyo Fombard. Thanks again for listening and let's not forget to be more understanding and nicer to one another.